up to number 10. I want to read uh, just a few verses of Scripture and introduce the, the Bible study tonight. Uh, beginning in verse number 12, Joshua 10 and verse number 12. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand, still, uh, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of, uh, of Agilon, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel." Here in this passage of scripture, we have a, a fantastic or a, a, an amazing miracle wrought by the Lord. And it's in the midst of a battle and God is giving the uh, nation of Israel a great victory. But the sun is beginning to go down. There's not going to be enough time to finish it. And, uh, and Joshua and Israel are chasing five kings, five heathen kings. And the Bible says that Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. And that God did that and gave them time. Uh, the sun stood still for basically a whole day and gave them time for, uh, for them to win the battle. I, as I've been thinking about, there's been so much going on. My wife and I were talking about it just recently and we know that you know, it's around the time of, you know, just past Valentine's Day and things like that. And, but it just seems like that there's so much else going on uh, from, I mean, a couple of different heart surgeries uh, in the church right now. And for a church, uh, for our size church, for, you know, the, um, the things that we're going through with our precious little twins and, and of course, uh, by extension, uh, uh, John and Amanda and then like say uh, a couple of more of heart surgeries that we've had or are going to have to have a uh, very soon. It just, it just feel sometimes life just feels like it's stuck. Like, like the, like the day is just, you know, you're stuck in this day and, and, and it brought my mind to the time where Joshua prayed for the sun to stand still. And it's not that we are seeking the sun to stand still, but I, I just, my thoughts were about this, this like this, almost this endless day that it was the length of two days. The Bible says that the sun stood still about a whole day. And I, and I wondered if there's some kind of an application for us uh, that when we feel like that that's where we are, when uh, when time stands still, and I, and I guess that's just what I would call the message tonight, is when time stands still, and see if there's something helpful for us here. Uh, before I go into any kind of an application, let me just talk about uh, the sun standing still. Now, people have pointed to that sometimes and said, well, see, the Bible is, the Bible is not uh, accurate, because we know because of science we know that the sun doesn't move, that the earth is rotating around the sun and that the sun's not moving. That's true. But here's the thing. The, the Bible is not, does not try to be a book of science. Now, wherever it touches on science, it's not wrong. But you would certainly say from our vantage point, it looks like the sun is moving. It looks like the sun moves across the sky, rises in the east and sets in the west. And then uh, when you can see the moon, the, the moon uh, does, follows the same course. And so from our perspective, you would describe it as if the sun stopped moving, you would describe it as the sun standing still because from our perspective, we know that we're the ones that are moving. But we also know that from our perspective, it, it looks as though the sun does move. You can look in the, uh, in the sky in the evening if you're in the northern hemisphere like we are. 
And it looks as though that the, um, the constellations in the northern sky, it looks like they are rotating counterclockwise all through the night. And uh, the truth is, we are rotating. <laughs> and so it's like if you're spinning, it's like if you get on the merry-go-round out here and someone pushes you hard, you're the one spinning, but you swear the world is spinning. Uh, because, because that's your perspective. That's from your vantage point. The earth rotates at approximately the rate near the equator. And if you can imagine a ball that is spinning, and I'm sorry, uh, young people, for getting you know school in here uh, when you thought school was over for the day. But if you can imagine a ball that is spinning... The surface of that sphere is spinning faster in the middle than it is out towards the ends where you have the the apex or the pivot points of that where it might not be hardly moving at all. And so near the equator, the earth is traveling at about, spinning at about 1,000 miles. Uh, Let me just double check. Uh, Yeah, in an hour, about 1,000 miles in an hour. Now, that's really fast. And the interesting thing that what I take from that is that the centrifugal force, now near the the poles, the the speed of the earth uh, in space is hardly moving at all. And so centrifugal force, and if you know what that is, it's the force of a spinning object that is pushing out. There's a, a it's called centrifugal force. It's what, you, if you were on that merry-go-round and you let go, it's the force that makes you fly out from the center and land up against the building, or it depends on how fast you're going. But that's centrifugal force. And so it's pushing out. And so that means that the centrifugal force at the, at the equator is much greater than at the north and south pole, which means that gravity is, seems less at the equator than at the poles because centrifugal force is pushing anything that has any weight out. So theoretically, I would be lighter at the at the equator than I would be if I was at the North Pole. So I need to move near the equator. That's my new weight loss program since all else has failed. Uh, I'm just going to move near the equator. Down in, down in Brazil, you're south of the equator, not far, you're, but a lot closer to it. So I might have to try that theory out one of these uh, times soon. Go down and weigh myself near the equator to see how much weight I lose by being down there. But if you were to then slow the earth down, uh, say by half speed. Then it will be moving at the equator about 500 miles uh, per hour and it would seemingly lengthen the daytime uh, by, by double. It would double the length of the day. And the Bible says here that the earth did not move. And again, we're just talking about if you slowed it down, you say exactly what happened. Well, I don't know exactly what happened other than the Bible says the earth did not, the sun didn't go down for about the length of a day. So God made one day basically into two. It's interesting. And if if you have any opportunity, if you have ever studied, um, Oh, religions of the world or things like that. You find that in every pagan culture and society, there are, there are uh, accounts that mirror Bible accounts. In every pagan culture, there is a creation story. Now, it's going to differ from the Bible. The Bible gives us the truth. Because it is given by inspiration of God, and God is the one that knows. But it is also is considered a verifying fact that all these cultures all have their own creation story to prove that there is a creation, because it spawns all of these variants, etc. 
And there is a, um, in uh, pagan, uh, um, oh, it'd be like Greek mythology. There is a, a story about the sun standing still for the space of a day. Now, what's interesting about that is that is considered verification of an actual event, although because they are pagans, they interpret it in you know, their own way. They make up a story to fit what they observed, but it is believed that, the, that there is a historical fact behind that. They didn't just randomly come up with some story to say, well, there was one day that lasted two days. And there's there's superstition a superstitious story uh, that the Greeks came up with is is it goes like this Apollo they believe the god Apollo is supposed to drive the chariot of the sun daily through the skies that's how they believe the sun gets where it needs to go is Apollo drives it on his chariot. And Apollo supposedly uh, granted Phaeton, who uh, was his son uh, and not very good at uh, doing this, uh, let him uh, drive the chariot one day. And because he could not keep the horses going in a straight line, uh, that uh, uh, it uh, took a lot longer and therefore went out of the proper track. And Jupiter, who they believed, uh, uh, was the supreme god, uh, irritated at Phaeton's rashness uh, and uh, thought that the heavens and earth would maybe collapse and that he'd do something, he cast him down with a thunderbolt, etc., etc. Now, so that's Greek mythology. You say, why do you bring that up? <coughs> because it, in, in the, in the uh, summation of historians, they believe that that verifies because, by the way, Greek mythology is not the only culture that has some account of a day that lasted two. So they believe that it verifies that an actual event happened. And we go to the Bible and we find out what it is. And what it is is Joshua prayed and God made the sun stand still about the space of a day so that they would have time to finish conquering and defeating uh, the Amorites as we have read to you just a few moments ago. Now, I say that all to say this. I went back and I reread this today or actually uh, yesterday, day before. I reread it looking for something because it does, it feels like sometimes to me and not just this time, but there are times in our lives where it feels like our day gets stuck, where a day becomes more than a day, where the normal course of life seems to suspend because something takes over our day. With some, it's been, some here it's been, you know, when a loved one got, the, the news that they have cancer and and uh, it seems like everything else just goes on hold because a day becomes longer than a day and feels like time begins to stand still for a, a period of time or maybe it's maybe it's something with you some sickness some news that you got concerning your own health or 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 a loved one and there are times when that happens and and is there something for us to learn from this, this event where time literally stood still? And, I, and let me just give you a, a few thoughts that I, as I read through here. Because it's not a time of nothing happening. In the book of Joshua here, chapter number 10, amazing things are happening when time stood still. And so while we're not asking for time to stand still, let me give you three thoughts about when time stood still. Number one, when time stood still, it was a great time of prayer. It was a great time of prayer. Because the Bible says this, if you still got your Bible there, the Bible says in verse number 14, there was no day like it before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. There was no day like it. 
what does that mean? What does it mean that the Lord hearkened to the voice of man? That means that Joshua prayed and God caused the sun to cease moving, to stand still for the express purpose of giving them victory. You know, when when time, it seems like stand still in your life, that ought to be a time of great prayer. In other words, and we are, we are trying to do that. We're trying to make more avenues of prayer with uh, the text messaging, reminding us of prayer. And I think that is such a tremendous thing. Um, just, to, just to go out at times of great need. Uh, that it just, and it does. It seems like time is standing still. We often feel like that we're just holding our breath sometimes because of all the things that are going on. But listen, it's not a time of nothing happening. It ought to be a time where we're spending more time in prayer and going before the Lord with our, with our heart's desire and bringing our needs to him. And it seems like, you know, when, when, isn't it amazing the things that we think are important until something important comes along? And all of a sudden, those things don't seem to matter at all. The things that we just think we, we you know, we've got our schedule and there's things that we just can't do without until something important comes along and none of those things matter. Whether it's a hobby of ours like hunting or fishing, whatever. And again, all my illustrations are guy illustrations. I'm sorry, ladies, you have to fill in the blanks for yours because I don't, I, 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 don't have a, I don't have a feminine side to even go to to figure that part out, amen. Not the inside, not the outside, left side, right side, upside or downside. Sorry, it's, it's just the way it is. But you can place so much importance on these things until, and you, and you do that, and you make it, you give it importance until, until time stands still, until you get that phone call, until you hear that news. And, and it was just, it was yesterday, I was watching uh, the uh, funeral. Uh, my, our son-in-law's father, uh, grandfather passed away. Dr. Don Green down in Lansing, Michigan, he had passed away and the funeral was, was live streamed and I watched much of the funeral. And, uh, and of course, you know, when uh, that happens, you know, uh, you're, you're, all of your plans just, they get, they put, they, they get suspended because time stands still. You've got plans to make. You've got the funeral to arrange. You've got family to care for. But it ought to be a time of great prayer. When, when life gets interrupted, and it won't always be. By the way, time's not going to stand still forever. It won't. It won't stand still forever. God caused one day to be two, but he didn't extend that. It won't stand still forever. And the heartache that you are bearing the, the uh, heaviness that you carry, the burden that is on your heart right now, will not last forever. But make it a time of great prayer, then of answered prayer, time of answered prayer. Number two, it was a time of God's power. It was a time of God's power. Realize this. Listen, while this was an answer to prayer for the Jews... It was certainly not an answer to prayer for the, for the Midianites or the Amorites who they were chasing. Because they were looking forward to, to the darkness when they could disperse and go and hide. And the sun just, just would not go down. It just would not stop shining. But listen to me. We need to understand that it's a time where, where God shows great power. Back in our text, the Bible says in, the, in verse 13, And the moon stood still. Uh, excuse me, the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. God, God gave, uh, they could sense, see the power of God because they saw Joshua pray and the sun stood still and gave them the opportunity to have the great victory. Hey, listen, when time stops and when, uh, when your time stands still and there are things that come into your life and you can have all your plans that you want to have, 
but a child becomes sick, something else along that line, and, and all those plans have to go away. But it doesn't mean God's not doing anything. It's a time of God's great power. We just need to look for what he's doing. You know, the world has been at a standstill for a couple of years now. The world has really been at a standstill. But it's time for us to, it's, it's not time of nothing going on. It's time for us to look and see the power of God. How God is working and God can and will work. So it's a time of answered prayer. It's a time of God's power. And then let me say thirdly, it's a time of spiritual victory. It's a time of spiritual victory because God gave them the victory. Notice this in verse number 14. There was no day like that day before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Notice that the Lord fought for Israel. It's, listen, this day where the sun stood still was a day of tremendous spiritual victory. And the same thing can be true in our lives when time stands still, when it seems like heartache comes or problems come and cause life to stand still. It can be a tremendous day of victory for the cause of Christ. This COVID thing doesn't have to be something that defeats You say, well, some churches you've mentioned, and I have, I've mentioned several churches that have, that have doubled during COVID-19. You say, well, that hasn't happened here. No, well, did you ever think about the fact that God with every action can be doing many things in different places? When God broke off, and I may preach this again soon, it's been years since I preached, on the goodness and severity of God when God broke off the natural branch of Israel and he grafted in the wild branch of the Gentiles. The Bible says, behold, the goodness and severity of God. Goodness on us who have believed, but severity on the nation of Israel. But God's not finished with them. But in one act, in one one motion, there's both goodness and severity. And think about this. There, in everything that God might be doing, in one thing that God does, God can be accomplishing, at, uh, in that case, two things. But if God can be accomplishing two, he can be doing four. If he can be doing four, he can be doing eight. And certainly if he can do eight, he can be doing 16. And into the hundreds and thousands of things that God could be doing. I was thinking about the early New Testament church and persecution came in the city of Jerusalem when the church was just there. And, it's, and, and you, you, you wouldn't certainly sit around in a persecuted church saying, oh, this is great. I, imagine, I can imagine their response to the persecution when you read the Bible, what was it? They scattered. They scattered. But it was God's way of getting the gospel throughout the world. Why, we might, we might uh, by the way, persecution has often, has often been the mechanism for God purifying a church. Purifying a church. So that those which remain are serious about the things of God. I, I don't pretend to exactly know all that God has in mind with, the, with this COVID virus. And yes, some churches have doubled and some have not. But I believe that God has a purpose. And to whatever his purpose is, we need to be mindful of the fact that God is fighting for us. And it's, it can be a day of great spiritual victory. What is important for us is not to try to figure out exactly all that God is doing, but rather to be faithful with what he's given us to do. I don't know. I, I've read different accounts of, of this event, but I read some years ago about a, an Italian violinist. Named, he was a, 
uh, a famous violinist. He still is a, he, he's not around anymore. He was in the uh, uh, mid, uh, mid 1800s, I believe. His name was uh, Nicola Pag- Paganini. I don't want to say that five times fast. But he was performing, the story goes, he was performing in, in, before a large audience when suddenly one of his violin strings broke. Well, violin is, is not like a piano. Piano, when it, a piano has strings that are aligned with a specific key, and if those strings are broke when you push the key, nothing happens. And so there's a lot of ways to make a specific note on a violin. You know, if, if you need to play a, a G note, you can, you can play that a G note in various ways on a violin, from the G string that is tuned to G, or pressing uh, in different places on the other strings, you can also make a, 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 the note come out a G. Well, this, this, this famous violinist, when one string broke, he simply continued to play on the other three strings and improvised the notes from the other strings by pressing the strings in different places because he was so talented. Well, he continued playing, and in just a few moments, another string broke. And now he was down to two strings. And again, I just read it. I didn't write it. He continued playing and the third string broke. And all he had left was the lowest, the lowest string <coughs> on the violin. And he, it said that he finished, he finished the song playing with one string. And when he got done, of course, everybody could see what was happening. And, and they were amazed And they stood and applauded and called for an encore. Well, there he stood with a violin with one string. And the story goes that he called out Paganini on one string. And he played an encore with one string. It's said that he went on to actually compose violin music for one string. The illustration I want to give you is this. When difficulty comes to you in your life and it appears that time stands still, that you don't know exactly what to do, but you know that whatever's happening takes precedence over everything else, whether it's sickness or financial difficulties or whatever it might be, If all you have is one string left to play, then play it to God's glory. If all you have left is prayer, because there's nothing else within your power to do anything else about, then pray to God's glory. Someone said the length of our days is with God. But how we fill those days is up to us. Listen, when time stands still, whatever string that you've got left, use it for the glory of God. If it's prayer, then pray. The, di- the time that st- time stood still, the day when time stood still in Joshua chapter number 10 was not a time of nothing happening. It was a time of answered prayer, a time of God's power, and a time of spiritual victory. And listen, I know that right now, sometimes I look around our church and with uh, the surgeries that are coming up and with, uh, with uh, the other challenges that are, and it just feels like we are, we are in this place where time is standing still, but it doesn't mean that God's not doing anything. And perhaps God is doing great things in our lives making us to be more consistent in our prayer life. You know, for five years, I believe that God has led us in a way 
to help us be better Christians, more consistent in our reading of the Scriptures and study of the Scriptures and hopefully memorizing of the Scriptures. And I've said several times that I've been asking for God to show us a way to help us be better Christians in our prayer life. You know, you never think about the ways that God might answer your prayers. But I believe our church is praying more now than it had, that I know of in recent years, more, more intently, more fervently, more consistently. When time stands still, it doesn't mean nothing is happening. Perhaps it means that God is trying to accomplish something great. We just need to find out what it is God would have us to do. And if every other string on our violin is broken because we can't physically do anything about it, it's without, we have no resources to take care of it, if all we have left is prayer, then let's pray, play that string to God's glory. Father, I pray that you would help us to always think in terms of your will for our life, not only individually but as a church, to look to heaven for our direction, to seek your will and your way for us, to give you the honor for victories won, to not look at difficulty as defeat, but rather opportunity for your grace and your glory. God, I pray that we will do all we can to be a people of prayer. Lord, if that's what we have, if there's nothing else we can do but pray, then may we pray. May we pray with faith, nothing wavering. May we pray with diligence, not giving up. May we pray uh, with uh, persistence uh, as men ought always to pray and not to faint. Then, God, may we pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as we stand to our feet and